Mr. Speaker, the Pope of the Holy See. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you Pope Francis of the Holy See. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, honorable members of the Congress, dear friends, I am most grateful for your invitation to address this joint session of Congress in the land of the free at the home of the brave. I would like to think that the reason for this is that I too am a son of this great continent from which we have all received so much and toward which we share a common responsibility. Each son or daughter of a given country has a mission, a personal and social responsibility. Your own responsibility as members of Congress is to enable this country by your legislative activity to grow as nation. You are the face of its people. They are rep representatives. You are called to defend and preserve the dignity of your fellow citizens in the tireless and demanding pursuit of the common good. For this is the chief aim of all politics. A political society endures when it seeks as a vocation 
to satisfy common needs by stimulating the growth of all its members, especially those in situations of greater vulnerability or risk. Legislative activity is always based on the care of the body people. To this, you have been invited, called, a convinced by those who elect you. Yours is a work which makes me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. On the one hand, the patriarch and lawgiver of the people of Israel symbolizes the need of people to keep alive their sense of unity by means of just legislation. On the other, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God and thus to the transcendent dignity of the human being. Moses provides us with a good synthesis of your work. You are asked to protect by means of the law the image and likeness fashioned by God on every human life. Today, I would like not only to address you, but through you, the entire people of the United States, here together with the representatives, I would like to take this opportunity to dialogue with the many thousands of men and women who strive, who strive each day to do a honest day's work, to bring home the daily bread, to save money, and one step at a time, to build a better life for their families. These are men and women who are not concerned simply with paying their taxes, but in their own quiet way, sustain the life of society. They, they generate solidarity by their actions and they create organizations which offer a helping hand to those most in need. I would also like to enter into dialogue with the many elderly persons who are a storehouse of wisdom forged by experience and who seek in many ways, especially through voluntary work, to share their stories and their insights. I know that many of them are retired, but still active. They keep working to build up this land. I also want to dialogue We'll, with all those young people who are working to realize their great and noble aspirations, who are not led astray by fatile proposals, and who face difficult, difficult situations, often, often as a result 
of immaturity on the part of many adults. I wish to dialogue with all of you, and I would like to do so through the historical memory of your people. My visit takes place at a time when men and women of goodwill are marking the anniversaries of several great Americans. The complexities of history and the reality of human weakness notwithstanding, these men and women, for all their many differences and limitations, will able, by hard work and self-sacrifice, some at the cost of their lives, to build a better future. They shaped fundamental values which endure forever in the spirit of the American people. A people with this spirit can live through many crises, tensions, and conflicts by always finding the resources to move forward and to do so with dignity. These men and women offer us a way of seeing and interpreting reality. In honor their memory, we are inspired even amid conflicts and in the here and now of each day to draw upon our deepest cultural reserve. I would like to mention four of these Americans. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, and Thomas Merton. This year marks the 150th anniversary of the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, the guardian of liberty, who labored tirelessly that this nation under God might have a new birth of freedom. Building a future of freedom requires love of the common good and cooperation in a spirit of subsidiarity and solidarity. All of us are quite aware of and deeply worried by the disturbing social and political situation of the world today. Our world is increasingly a place of violent conflict, hatred, and brutal atrocities, committed even in the name of God and of religion. We know that no religion is immune from forms of individual delusion or ideological extremism. This means that we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism, whether religious or of any other kind. A delicate balance is required to combat violence perpetrated in the name of a religion 
an ideology or an economic system, while also safeguarding religious freedom, intellectual freedom, and individual freedoms. But there is another temptation, which we must especially guard against. The simplistic reductionism, which sees only good or evil, or if you will, the righteous and sinners the contemporary world, with its open wounds, which affect so many of our brothers and sisters, demands that we confront every form of polarization, which, will, which would divide it into these two camps. We know that in the attempt to be fit of enemy without, we can be tempted to feed the enemy within, to imitate the hatred and violence of tyrants and murders is the best way to take their place. That is something which you, as people, reject. <laughs> Our response must instead be one of hope and healing, of peace and justice. We are asked to a summon the courage and the intelligence to resolve today's many geopolitical and economic crises, even in the developed world, the effects of unjust structures and actions are all too apparent. Our efforts must aim at restoring hope, righting wrongs, maintaining commitments, and thus promoting the well-being of individuals and most peoples. We must move forward together as one in a renewed spirit of fraternity and solidarity, cooperating generously for the common good. <laughs> the challenges facing us today call for a renewal of that spirit of cooperation which has accomplished so much good throughout the history of the United States. The complexity, the gravity, and the urgency of these challenges demand that we pool our resources and talents and resolve to support one another with respect for our differences and our convictions of conscience. In this land, the various religious denominations have greatly contributed to building and strengthening society. It is, it is important that today, as in the past, the voice of faith 
continuing to be heard, for it is a voice of fraternity and love which tries to bring out the best in each person and in each society. Such cooperation is a powerful resource in the battle to eliminate new global forms of slavery, born of great injustices, which can be overcome only through new policies and new forms of social consensus. Politics is instead an expression of our compelling need to live as one in order to build as one the greatest common good, that of a community which sacrifices particular interest in order to share injustice and peace, its goods, its interests, its social life. I do not underestimate the difficulty that this involves, but I encourage you in this effort. Here, too, I think of the march which Martin Luther King led from Selma to Montgomery 50 years ago as part of the campaign to fulfill his dream of full civil and political rights for African Americans. That, that dream continues to inspire us all. And I am happy that America continues to be, for many, a land of dreams. Dreams which lead to action, to participation, to commitment. Dreams which awaken what is deepest and truest in the life of the people. In recent centuries, millions of people came to this land to pursue their dream of building a future in freedom. We, the people of this continent, are no fearful of foreigners, because most of us, because most of us were once foreigners. I say this to you as the son of immigrants, knowing that so many of you are also descendants from immigrants. <laughs> Tragically, the rights of those who were here belong before us were not always respected. For those peoples and their nations, from the art 
of American democracy, I wish to reaffirm my highest esteem and appreciation. Those first contacts were often turbulent and violent, but we know that it's very difficult to judge the past by the criteria of the present. Nonetheless, when the stranger in our midst appeals to us, we must not repeat the sins and the errors of the past. We must resolve now to live as nobly as, and as justly as possible as we educate new generations not to turn their back on our neighbors and everything around us. Building a nation calls us to recognize that we must constantly relate to others, rejecting a mindset of hostility in order to adopt one of reciprocal subsidiarity in a constant effort to do our best. I'm confident that we can do this. Our world is facing a refugee crisis of a magnitude non seen since the Second World War. This presents us with great challenges and many hard decisions. On this continent, two thousand of persons are led to travel north in search of a better life for themselves and for their loved ones, in search of greater opportunity. It is not what we want for our own children. We, we must not be taken aback by the numbers, but rather view them as persons seeing their faces and listening <laughs> to their stories, trying to respond as best we can to their situation, to respond in a way which is always human, just, and fraternal. We need to avoid a common temptation, naive words, to discard whatever proves troublesome. Let us remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you. Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. This rule points us in a clear direction. Let us treat others with the same passion and compassion with which we want to be treated. Let us seek for others the same possibilities which we seek for ourselves. Let us help others to grow as we would like to be helped ourselves. In a world 
If we want security, let us give security. If we want life, let us give life. If we want opportunity, let us provide these opportunities. The yardstick we use for others will be the yardstick which time used for us. The golden rule also reminds us of our responsibility to protect and defend human life at every stage of its development. This This conviction has, has led me from the beginning of my ministry to advocate at different levels the global abolition of the death penalty. I am, I am convinced that this way is the best since every life is sacred, every human person is endowed with an inalienable dignity, and society can only benefit from the rehabilitation of those convicted of crimes. Recently, my brother bishops here in the United States renewed the call for the abolition of the death penalty. Not only, not only do I support them, but I also offer encouragement to all those who are convinced that a just and necessary punishment must never exclude the dimension of hope and the goal of rehabilitation. In these times, when social concerns are so important, I cannot fail to mention the servant of God, Dorothy Day, who founded the Catholic Worker Movement. Her social activism, her passion for justice and for the cause of the oppressed were inspired by the gospel, her faith, and the example of the saints. How much progress has been made in this area, in so many parts of the world. How much has been done in these first years of the third millennium to raise people out of extreme poverty? I know that you share my conviction that much more still needs to be done, and in times of crisis and economic hardship, a spirit of global solidarity must not be lost. At the same time, I would encourage you to keep in mind all those people around us who are trapped in a cycle of poverty. 
they too need to be given hope. The fight against poverty and hunger must be fought constantly and on many fronts, especially in its course. I know that many Americans today, as in the past, are working to deal with this problem. It goes without saying that part of this great effort is the creation and distribution of wealth. The right use of natural resources, the proper application of technology, and the harnessing of the spirit of enterprise are essential elements of an economy which seeks to be modern, inclusive, and sustainable. <laughs> Business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth, wealth and improving the world. It can be fruitful source of prosperity from the area in which it operates, especially if it sees the creation of jobs as an essential part of its service to the common good. <laughs> this common good also includes the earth a central theme of the encyclical, which I recently wrote in order to enter into, into the dialogue with all people about our common home. We need a conversation which includes everyone since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. <clears throat> In Laudato Si, I call for a courageous and responsible effort to redirect our steps and to avert the most serious effects of the environmental deterioration caused by human activity. I'm convinced that we can make a difference. I'm sure. And I have no doubt that the United States and this Congress have an important role to play. Now is the time for courageous action and strategies. I'm at implementing a culture of care and an integrated approach to combating poverty restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. <clears throat> we have the freedom needed to limit and direct technology, to devise intelligent ways of developing and limiting our power and to put technology at the service of 
another type of progress, one which is here, more human, more social, more integral. In this regard, I am confident that America's outstanding academic and research institutions can make a vital contribution in the years ahead. A century ago, at the beginning of the Great War, which Pope Benedict XV termed appointed slaughter, another notable American was born, the Cistercian monk Thomas Merton. He remains a source of a spiritual inspiration and guide for many people. In his autobiography, Merton wrote, I came into the world free by nature in the ima image of God. I was nevertheless the prisoner of my own violence I must own selfishness in the image of the world into which is I was born. That world was the picture of hell, full of men like myself, loving God and yet hating him, born to love him, living instead in fear of hopeless self-contradictory hangers. Merton was, above all, a man of prayer, a thinker who challenged the certitudes of this time and opened new horizons for souls and for the church. He was also a man of dialogue, a promoter of peace between peoples and religions. From this perspective of dialogue, I would like to recognize the efforts made in recent months to help overcome historic differences linked to painful episodes of the past. It is my duty to build bridges and to help all men and women in any way possible to do the same. When countries which have been at odds resume the path of the dialogue, a dialogue which may have been interrupted for the most legitimate of reasons, new opportunities open up for all. <clears throat> this that required and requires courage and daring, which is not the same as irresponsibility. A good political leader is one who, with the interests of all in mind, seizes the moment in a spirit of openness and pragmatism. A good political leader always opts to initiate processes rather than possessing space.
being at the service of dialogue and peace also means being truly determined to minimize and in the long term to end the many armed conflict throughout our world. Here, we have to ask ourselves, why are deadly weapons being sold to those who plan to inflict untold suffering on individuals and society? Sadly, the answer, as we all know, is simply for money money that is drenched in blood, often innocent blood, in the face of the shameful and culpable silence, it is our duty to confront the problem and to stop the armed strike. Three sons and one daughter of this land, four individuals of four dreams. Lincoln, liberty. Martin Luther King, liberty in plurality and non-exclusion. Dorothy Day, social justice and the rights of persons. And Thomas Merton, the capacity for dialogue and openness to God. Four representatives of American people. I will end my visit to your country in Philadelphia, where I will take part in the World Meeting of Families. It is my wish that throughout on visit, the family should be a recurrent theme. How essential the family has been to the building of this country. and how worthy it remains for our support and encouragement. Yet, I cannot hide my concern for the family, which is threatened, perhaps as never before, from within and without. Fundamental relations have been called into question as is the very basis of marriage and the family. I can only reiterate the importance and above all, the richness and the beauty of family life. In particular, I would like to call attention to those family members who are the most vulnerable, the young. For many of them, a future filled with countless possibilities beckons. Yet so many others seem disoriented and aimless, trapped in a hopeless maze of violence 
abuse, and despair. Their problems are our problems. We cannot avoid them. We need to face them together, to talk about them, and to seek effective solutions rather than getting bogged down in discussion at the risk of oversimplifying. We might say that we live in a culture with pressures. Young people known to start a family because they lack possibilities for the future. Yet, the same culture presents others with so many options that they too are dissuaded from starting a family. A nation can be considered great when it defends liberty, as Lincoln did, when it fosters a culture which enables people to dream of full rights for all brothers and sisters, as Martin Luther King so to do, when it strives for justice and the cause of the oppressed, as Dorothy Day did by her tireless work, the fruit of a faith which becomes dialogue and sues peace in the contemplative style of Thomas Merton. In this remark, I have sought to present some of the richness of your cultural heritage, of the spirit of the American people. It is my desire that this spirit continue to develop and grow so that as many young people as possible can inherit and dwell in a land which has inspired so many people to dream. God bless America. <laughs>